Coming up today in one of the starkest warnings yet, the top U.S. military official says North Korea now has the capability to launch a nuclear-tipped missile at the continental United States. Spending at local discount stores drops in March, but it's a different story at the upper end of the market with wealthier Koreans splashing out on luxury goods. Plus, a local think tank is urging the Korean government to do more to support the nation's elderly, saying the issues are only going to get worse in the years to come. These stories are more coming right up. Hello, it's noon on Wednesday, the 8th of April. You're tuned in to our midday newscast here on Adilang TV. Thanks ever so much for joining us. I'm Mark Broom. We begin with North Korea's weapons capability. A senior U.S. military leader says Pyongyang now has the ability to road mobile ICBM capable of carrying nuclear weapons to the mainland United States. This as the U.S. defense chief visits Japan and South Korea this week to discuss regional security issues. Na Hyung Young reports. The doubts about a North Korean missile are turning into a real threat. Many watchers had believed that North Korea's KN-08 intercontinental ballistic missile, paraded in 2012, was a mock-up. But a senior U.S. military official says Pyongyang has likely made a breakthrough. Our assessment is, is that uh, they have the ability to put it on a nuclear weapon on a KN-08 and shoot it uh, uh, at the homeland. While refusing to explain the evidence, Admiral Courtney said the missile is operational today, but added that the regime has not yet tested the weapon. The KN-08 could have a range of up to 9,000 kilometers, according to North Korea monitoring website 38 North, which means it could reach the U.S. mainland. The U.S. is known to have about 30 ground-based interceptors on its west coast, but the fact that the KN-08 is a road mobile weapon is going to make it difficult for Washington to carry out a preemptive strike on the missile. The commander's comments and the report come amid U.S. Defense Secretary Ashton Carter's visit to Japan and Korea this week. The speculation is that these factors will make Washington's alleged push for deployment of its so-called THAAD missile defense system to South Korea more legitimate. Na hyun Arirang News. Now, another senior U.S. official says Washington is not holding any official talks with South Korea regarding a U.S. missile defense system known as Terminal High Altitude Area Defense, or THAAD for short. However, he did stress that THAAD is critical in defending the South against North Korea's ballistic missile threats. Son Jong-in reports. Frank Rose, U.S. Deputy Assistant Secretary of State for Arms Control, Verification and Compliance, has reiterated that no decision or official negotiations have been held with South Korea regarding the possible deployment of a THAAD battery to its soil. But Rose added that if they were to move in that direction, THAAD would be a critical capability in dealing with the threats posed by North Korea. Rose also stressed that the battery does not have any capability against the China's strategic deterrent, rejecting the notion that such a deployment would pose a threat to China and Russia's security interests. Elaine Bunn, U.S. Deputy Assistant Secretary of Defense for Nuclear and Missile Defense Policy, shared a similar stance on the issue, saying it's premature for China to worry since Seoul and Washington are not currently holding any formal discussions on the matter. However, she added that even when consultations do take place, it will be for the U.S. and South Korea to decide what course to take. Son Jong-in, Arirang News. The floor leader of Korea's ruling Senuri Party has urged the government to salvage the Seolho ferry and keep its promise to find every missing body. Addressing the full assembly on Wednesday, Yu, Yu Sung Min called for a swift conclusion of a civilian led technical review on how to recover the vessel, which sank on April 16th last year, killing more than 300 passengers. He then appealed to the opposition party to actively participate in discussions to reform Korea's costly public employee pension system. Referring 
to that possible stationing of the controversial THAAD US anti-missile system to South Korea. You stress that Seoul needs to display a strong deterrence against North Korea's security threats to achieve regional peace. The main opposition party's leader, Moon Jae-in, will address the assembly on Thursday. The recent nuclear accord between world powers and Iran is expected to benefit Korean companies that once did a brisk business in the oil-rich country. Tehran has been subject to international sanctions since 2006 over its nuclear program, and these could be lifted if the framework deal is sealed in June. Shin Se-min tells us more. Korean firms doing business in Iran may be back on track soon. With economic sanctions on Iran expected to be eased in a few months, Korean companies, mostly construction firms, are gearing up for a wide range of business opportunities. Iran was one of the largest construction markets for Korean builders before the sanctions were imposed. Companies like Tedim International, GSENC and Hyundai ENC were the leading planned construction firms doing business there in the early 2000s. But the orders from Tehran stopped in 2009, with GSENC clinching the last 12 billion U.S. dollar deal. Now, with the expected easing of sanctions on Iran this year, market watchers say Korea's construction business in Iran could amount to approximately 60 trillion won, or nearly 55 billion dollars this year, up from a mere 9 billion in the early 2000s. Experts also say that because Tehran is in the midst of boosting its infrastructure, the contracts for Korean builders will involve facility maintenance and expansion of existing plants. That's not all. Korean steelmakers, airlines and auto parts makers can also expect to reap the benefits of the nuclear deal. And back in Korea, drivers may feel the drop in global oil prices even more, according to Hong jong hwa a researcher at the Korea International Trade Association, as an expansion in Iranian crude oil exports from the oil-rich country is expected to bring international oil prices down even further. Shin Se-min, Arirang News. North Korea has responded positively to efforts by South Korean businessmen to resolve the wage disputes at the inter-Korean Kaesong Industrial Complex, raising hope the issue can be sorted out soon. Kim Hyun-bin reports. Several South Korean executives from the Kaesong Industrial District Management Committee went into the complex in North Korea on Tuesday. They held an emergency meeting to discuss wages with officials from the North Central Special Development Guidance Bureau, which is in charge of running the zone. We explained to the North that realistically the companies are stuck in a harsh situation. Since inter-Korean tensions are high, the wage hike, which is not a big deal, is amplified. We strongly requested that North Korean officials talk to the management to promptly resolve the issue. They agreed to tell their higher-ups. The meeting comes as payday for North Korean workers approaches on April 10th. Pyongyang unilaterally demanded a pay raise of around 5 percent, to 74 U.S. dollars a month for its workers in Kaesong, effective that date. The committee says it has a little bit of a grace period. Depending on the situation of the company, they have a grace period until the 20th of this month to pay their workers, so we do have some time left. Even with the grace period, if a compromise is not made by the 20th of April, South Korean companies may have to plan for the worst-case scenario of the complex closing down. Kim Hyun-bin, Arirang News. Paju. The president of the World Bank has welcomed the new China-led regional development institution and vowed to find innovative ways to work with it. Speaking in Washington on Tuesday, Jim Yong Kim said the World Bank and the Asian Infrastructure Investment Bank could become strong allies in the push to build new infrastructure and to help the world's poorest people. He added that he will quickly identify ways by which the two international financial institutions can collaborate. Now, Kim's comments come ahead of talks next week in Washington between the World Bank and the International Monetary Fund, where he is expected to hold talks with Chinese officials. Korea is one of more than 50 nations that have so far signed up to join the AIIB. 
Apple is known for having very loyal customers, with iPhone and Mac users coming back for upgrades time and time again. But a new survey shows that it's not the only company with customers dedicated to its products. Samsung Electronics has topped an online poll on customer loyalty by US-based corporate research site SurveyMonkey. The Korean tech giant scored 35 points and beat its arch-rival Apple by seven points. Both companies ranked well above the industry benchmark of 19 points. Now, this survey was based on data collected in the fourth quarter of last year. On customer service, however, Samsung scored far behind Apple. Samsung and Apple are vying for the lead in the smartphone market with their new Galaxy S6 series and iPhone 6 series. The gap between the haves and the have-nots is widening in Korea, as it is in most countries around the world. And while most people struggle to make ends meet and are cutting back on the basics, Korea's richest 10% are spending more on designer brands and luxury goods. Gwon Soa reports. The polarization of spending habits in Korea is getting worse as the nation's low- and mid-income earners struggle to get by while the rich continue to enjoy the good times despite the sluggish economy. Data released by the retail industry on Wednesday shows first-quarter sales at large retailers, popular among consumers who tend to watch their pennies, mostly declined compared to one year ago. Lotte Mart, the second biggest retailer in the country, posted a 3% drop in sales, and Home Plus an almost 1% dip, while Emart, the nation's number one retailer, saw sales edge up a mere 0.8%. Breaking it down, Emart's fashion and grain sales in March both plunged by over 10% on year. Fisheries and processed food fell by 9 and 3%, respectively. The big supermarkets have tried to boost sales by reducing the price of everyday products such as milk, but the figures speak for themselves as sales managers say the strategies weren't that effective. On the other hand, sales of more expensive products like imported spices and vegetables weren't that affected. That trend is even clearer when we look at sales at two of Korea's high-end department stores Lotte and Hyundai. They recorded gains of between 8 and 15 percent in their luxury designer label sales. This reflects a recent study which shows Korea's richest 10 percent own nearly half of the nation's wealth. Experts say sellers are focusing their marketing strategies on products like expensive desserts and coffee, raising concerns that spending trends will polarize even more. Kwon Soa, Arirang News. Now, it seems that the majority of Koreans believe that the government should be doing more to support the nation's senior citizens who did so much making Korea the modern country it is today. The report published by a local think tank is calling for more balance between families, society and the government. Connie Kim reports. Children taking care of their aging parents has been the norm in Korea's deep-rooted Confucian culture for centuries. But is it still the case these days? I don't think it's possible for families to solely look after aging parents. Life expectancy has gone on longer while people are retiring earlier. After raising my kids, I don't want to become a burden to them after I stop working. I think the government needs to play an active role in supporting seniors. This seems to be the growing public sentiment. A report by the Korea Development Institute shows that over the past decade, children who think they should support their aging parents plunged from about 70 percent to slightly over 30 percent. The drop is mainly due to the shrinking size of families and parents putting a priority on investing in their children's education. These factors are quickly diminishing the traditional norm of supporting elderly parents. Kim, the author of the report, says a changing culture has resulted in more senior citizens unable to financially support themselves. Korea's elderly poverty and suicide rates rank the highest among OECD nations. In light of those grim figures, this report calls on families, society and the government to work together to find ways to economically and emotionally support aging generations. It also calls for the government to create a system that will revitalize the social well-being of seniors. 
Some community welfare centers have programs that help engage the elderly and younger generations. But there needs to be more social workers and programs that aim to nurture active participation from the elderly population. While systematic support is key, experts also say it's necessary for individuals to do more to prepare for their senior years. Many are aware of the seriousness of Korea's aging society and elderly poverty problem, but not much is actively done. People should have a portfolio of income sources aside from their monthly pension payments. Korea's welfare ministry says three out of ten people over the age of 65 continue to work post-retirement, mainly to support daily living costs. This, as 11 percent of senior citizens say they've thought of committing suicide, mainly due to economic hardships. Connie Kim, Arirang News. Well, those are the stories we're following at this hour. I'm Mark Broom. Have a wonderful day and thanks as always for watching. We do hope to see you at the same time tomorrow. Goodbye.